Some material came to him in his print shop which was of exceptionally high quality. The printer who had done this job was a new employee who had been having difficulty adjusting to the job. His supervisor was upset about what he considered a negative attitude and was seriously thinking of terminating his services. When Mr. Roper was informed of this situation, he personally went over to the print shop and had a talk with the young man. He told him how pleased he was with the work he had just received and pointed out it was the best work he had seen produced in that shop for some time. He pointed out exactly why it was superior and how important the young man's contribution was to the company. Do you think this affected that young printer's attitude toward the company? Within days there was a complete turnabout. He told several of his co-workers about the conversation and how someone in the company really appreciated good work. And from that day on, he was a loyal and dedicated worker. What Mr. Roper did was not just flatter the young printer and say, you're good, he specifically pointed out how his work was superior, because he had singled out a specific accomplishment, rather than just making general flattering remarks, his praise became much more meaningful to the person to whom it was given. Everybody likes to be praised, but when praise is specific, it comes across as sincere not something the other person may be saying just to make one feel good. Remember, we all crave appreciation and recognition and will do almost anything to get it. But nobody wants insincerity. Nobody wants flattery. Talk about changing people. If you and I will inspire the people with whom we come in contact to a realization of the hidden treasures they possess, we can do far more than change people. We can literally transform them, exaggeration, then listen to these sage words from William James, one of the most distinguished psychologists and philosophers America has ever produced. Compared with what we ought to be, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, the human individual thus lives far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use. Yes, you who are reading these lines possess powers of various sorts which you habitually fail to use, and one of these powers you are probably not using to the fullest extent is your magic ability to praise people and inspire them with a realization of their latent possibilities. Abilities wither under criticism, they blossom under encouragement. To become a more effective leader of people, apply. Principle 6. Praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. 28. Give a dog a good name. What do you do when a person who has been a good worker begins to turn in shoddy work? You can fire him or her, but that really doesn't solve anything. You can berate the worker, but this usually causes resentment. Henry Henke, a service manager for a large truck dealership in Lowell, Indiana, had a mechanic whose work had become less than satisfactory. Instead of bawling him out or threatening him, Mr. Henke called him into his office and had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him. Bill he said, you are a fine mechanic. You have been in this line of work for a good number of years. You have repaired many vehicles to the customer's satisfaction. In fact, we've had a number of compliments about the good work you have done. Yet, of late, the time you take to complete each job has been increasing and your work has not been up to your own old standards. Because you have been such an outstanding mechanic in the past, I felt sure you would want to know that I am not happy with this situation, and perhaps jointly we could find some way to correct the problem. Bill responded that he hadn't realized he had been falling down in his duties, and assured his boss that the work he was getting was not out of his range of expertise, and he would try to improve in the future. Did he do it? You can be sure he did. He once again became a fast and thorough mechanic. With that reputation Mr. Hunky had given him to live up to, how could he do anything else but turn out work comparable to that which he had done in the past? The average person said Samuel Vauklin, then president of the Baldwin Locomotive Works, can be led readily if you have his or her respect, and if you show that you respect that person for some kind of ability. In short, if you want to improve a person in a certain aspect, act as though that particular trait were already one of his or her outstanding characteristics. Shakespeare said, assume a virtue, if you have it not, and it might be well to assume and state openly that other people have the virtue you want them to develop. 
give them a fine reputation to live up to, and they will make prodigious efforts, rather than see you disillusioned, Georgette LeBlanc, in her book Souvenirs, My Life with Meterlink, describes the startling transformation of a humble Belgian Cinderella, a servant girl from a neighboring hotel, brought my meals she wrote, she was called Marie the dishwasher because she had started her career as a scullery assistant, she was a kind of monster, cross-eyed, bandolid, poor in flesh and spirit, one day, while she was holding my plate of macaroni in her red hand, I said to her point blank, Marie, you do not know what treasures are within you, Accustomed to holding back her emotion, Marie waited a few moments, not daring to risk the slightest gesture for fear of a castestriff. Then she put the dish on the table, sighed and said ingenuously, Madam, I would never have believed it. She did not doubt, she did not ask a question. She simply went back to the kitchen and repeated what I had said, and such is the force of faith that no one made fun of her. From that day on, she was even given a certain consideration, but the most curious change of all occurred in the humble Marie herself. Believing she was the tabernacle of unseen marvels, she began taking care of her face and body so carefully that her starved youth seemed to bloom and modestly hide her plainness. Two months later, she announced her coming marriage with the nephew of the chef. I'm going to be a lady, she said, and thanked me. A small phrase had changed her entire life. Georgette LeBlanc had given Marie the dishwasher a reputation to live up to and that reputation had transformed her. Bill Parker, a sales representative for a food company in Daytona Beach, Florida, was very excited about the new line of products his company was introducing and was upset when the manager of a large independent food market turned down the opportunity to carry it in his store. Bill brooded all day over this rejection and decided to return to the store before he went home that evening and try again. Jack he said, since I left this morning I realized I hadn't given you the entire picture of our new line, and I would appreciate some of your time to tell you about the points I omitted. I have respected the fact that you are always willing to listen and are big enough to change your mind, when the facts warrant a change. Could Jack refuse to give him another hearing? Not with that reputation to live up to. One morning Dr. Martin Fitzhugh, a dentist in Dublin, Ireland, was shocked when one of his patients pointed out to him that the metal cup holder which she was using to rinse her mouth was not very clean. True, the patient drank from the paper cup, not the holder, but it certainly was not professional to use tarnished equipment. When the patient left, Dr. Fitzhugh retreated to his private office to write a note to Bridget, the charwoman, who came twice a week to clean his office. He wrote, My dear Bridget, I see you so seldom. I thought I'd take the time to thank you for the fine job of cleaning you've been doing. By the way, I thought I'd mention that since two hours, twice a week, is a very limited amount of time. Please feel free to work an extra half hour from time to time. If you feel you need to do those once in a while things like polishing the cup holders and the like, I, of course, will pay you for the extra time. The next day, when I walked into my office Dr. Fitzhugh reported, my desk had been polished to a mirror-like finish, as had my chair, which I nearly slid out of. When I went into the treatment room I found the shiniest, cleanest chrome-plated cup holder I had ever seen nestled in its receptacle. I had given my charwoman a fine reputation to live up to, and because of this small gesture, she outperformed all her past efforts. How much additional time did she spend on this? That's right none at all. There is an old saying, give a dog a bad name, and you may as well hang him, but give him a good name and see what happens. When Mrs. Ruth Hopkins, a fourth grade teacher in Brooklyn, New York, looked at her class roster the first day of school. Her excitement and joy of starting a new term was tinged with anxiety. In her class this year she would have Tommy T, the school's most notorious bad boy. His third grade teacher had constantly complained about Tommy to colleagues, the principal and anyone else who would listen. He was not just mischievous, he caused serious discipline problems in the class picked fights with the boys, teased the girls, was fresh to the teacher, and seemed to get worse as he grew older. Mrs. Hopkins decided to face the Tommy problem immediately. When she greeted her new students, she made little comments to each of them. Rose, that's a pretty dress you are wearing, Alicia. I hear you draw beautifully. When she came to Tommy, she looked him straight in the eyes and said, Tommy, 
I understand you are a natural leader. I'm going to depend on you to help me make this class the best class in the fourth grade this year. She reinforced this over the first few days by complimenting Tommy on everything he did and commenting on how this showed what a good student he was. With that reputation to live up to, even a nine-year-old couldn't let her down and he didn't. If you want to excel in that difficult leadership role of changing the attitude or behavior of others, use Principle 7. Give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. 29. Make the fault seem easy to correct. A bachelor friend of mine, about 40 years old, became engaged, and his fiancé persuaded him to take some belated dancing lessons. The Lord knows I needed dancing lessons he confessed as he told me the story, for I dance just as I did when I first started 20 years ago. The first teacher I engaged probably told me the truth. She said I was all wrong. I would just have to forget everything and begin all over again, but that took the heart out of me, I had no incentive to go on, so I quit her, the next teacher may have been lying, but I liked it, she said nonchalantly that my dancing was a bit old fashioned perhaps, but the fundamentals were alright, and she assured me I wouldn't have any trouble learning a few new steps, the first teacher had discouraged me by emphasizing my mistakes, this new teacher did the opposite, she kept praising the things I did right and minimizing my errors. You have a natural sense of rhythm she assured me. You really are a natural born dancer. Now my common sense tells me that I always have been and always will be a fourth rate dancer. Yet deep in my heart. I still like to think that maybe she meant it. To be sure, I was paying her to say it but why bring that up? At any rate. I know I am a better dancer than I would have been if she hadn't told me I had a natural sense of rhythm. That encouraged me. That gave me hope. That made me want to improve. Tell your child, your spouse, or your employee that he or she is stupid or dumb at a certain thing, has no gift for it, and is doing it all wrong. And you have destroyed almost every incentive to try to improve. But use the opposite technique. Be liberal with your encouragement. Make the thing seem easy to do. Let the other person know that you have faith in his ability to do it, that he has an undeveloped flair for it, and he will practice until the dawn comes in the window in order to excel. Lowell Thomas, a superb artist in human relations, used this technique, he gave you confidence, inspired you with courage and faith. For example, I spent a weekend with Mr. and Mrs. Thomas, and on Saturday night, I was asked to sit in on a friendly bridge game before a roaring fire. Bridge? Oh, no, 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 not me. I knew nothing about it. The game had always been a black mystery to me. No, no, impossible. Whitedale? It is no trick at all Lowell replied. There is nothing to bridge except memory and judgment. You've written articles on memory. Bridge will be a cinch for you. It's right up your alley. Speaking of bridge reminds me of Eli Culbertson, whose books on bridge have been translated into a dozen languages and have sold more than a million copies. Yet he told me he never would have made a profession out of the game if a certain young woman hadn't assured him he had a flair for it. When he came to America in 1922, he tried to get a job teaching in philosophy and sociology, but he couldn't. Then he tried selling coal, and he failed at that. Then he tried selling coffee, and he failed at that too. Then he met a pretty bridge teacher, Josephine Dillon fell in love and married her. She noticed how carefully he analyzed his cards and persuaded him that he was a potential genius at the card table. It was that encouragement and that alone, Culbertson told me, that caused him to make a profession of bridge. Clarence M. Jones, one of the instructors of our course in Cincinnati, Ohio, told how encouragement and making faults seem easy to correct completely changed the life of his son. In 1970 my son David, who was then 15 years old, came to live with me in Cincinnati. He had led a rough life. In 1958 his head was cut open in a car accident, leaving a very bad scar on his forehead. In 1960 his mother and I were divorced, and he moved to Dallas, Texas with his mother. Until he was 15 he had spent most of his school years in special classes for slow learners in the Dallas school system. Possibly because of the scar, school administrators had decided he was brain injured and could not function at a normal level. He was two years behind his age group, so he was only in the seventh grade. 
Yet he did not know his multiplication tables, added on his fingers, and could barely read. There was one positive point. He loved to work on radio and TV sets. He wanted to become a TV technician. I encouraged this and pointed out that he needed math to qualify for the training. I decided to help him become proficient in this subject. We obtained four sets of flashcards. Multiplication, division, addition and subtraction. As we went through the cards, we put the correct answers in a discard stack. When David missed one, I gave him the correct answer, and then put the card in the repeat stack, until there were no cards left. I made a big deal out of each card he got right, particularly if he had missed it previously. Each night we would go through the repeat stack until there were no cards left. Each night we timed the exercise with a stopwatch. I promised him that when he could get all the cards correct in 8 minutes with no incorrect answers, we would quit doing it every night. This seemed an impossible goal to David. The first night it took 52 minutes, the second night 48, then 45, 44, 41, then under 40 minutes. We celebrated each reduction. I'd call in my wife, and we would both hug him, and we'd all dance a jig. At the end of the month he was doing all the cards perfectly in less than 8 minutes. When he made a small improvement he would ask to do it again. He had made the fantastic discovery that learning was easy and fun. Naturally his grades in algebra took a jump. It is amazing how much easier algebra is when you can multiply. He astonished himself by bringing home a B in math. That had never happened before. Other changes came with almost unbelievable rapidity. His reading improved rapidly, and he began to use his natural talents in drawing. Later in the school year his science teacher assigned him to develop an exhibit. He chose to develop a highly complex series of models to demonstrate the effect of levers. It required skill not only in drawing and model making, but in applied mathematics. The exhibit took first prize in his school's science fair and was entered in the city competition and won third prize for the entire city of Cincinnati. That did it. Here was a kid who had flunked two grades who had been told he was brain damaged who had been called Frankenstein by his classmates, and told his brains must have leaked out of the cut on his head. Suddenly he discovered he could really learn and accomplish things. The result? From the last quarter of the 8th grade all the way through high school, he never failed to make the honor roll. In high school he was elected to the National Honor Society. Once he found learning was easy, his whole life changed. If you want to help others to improve, remember, Principle 8. Use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. Making people glad to do what you want. Back in 1915, America was aghast. For more than a year, the nations of Europe had been slaughtering one another on a scale never before dreamed of in all the bloody annals of mankind. Could peace be brought about? No one knew. But Woodrow Wilson was determined to try. He would send a personal representative, a peace emissary, to counsel with the warlords of Europe. William Jennings Bryan, Secretary of State. Bryan, the peace advocate, long to go. He saw a chance to perform a great service and make his name immortal. But Wilson appointed another man, his intimate friend and advisor Colonel Edward M. House. And it was House's thorny task to break the unwelcome news to Bryan, without giving him offense. Brian was distinctly disappointed when he heard I was to go to Europe as the peace emissary Colonel House records in his diary. He said he had planned to do this himself. You see the intimation? House practically told Brian that he was too important for the job and Brian was satisfied. Woodrow Wilson followed that policy even when inviting William Gibbs McAdoo to become a member of his cabinet. That was the highest honor he could confer upon anyone, and yet Wilson extended the invitation in such a way as to make McAdoo feel doubly important. Here is the story in McAdoo's own words. He Wilson said that he was making up his cabinet, and that he would be very glad, if I would accept a place in it as Secretary of the Treasury. He had a delightful way of putting things. He created the impression that by accepting this great honor, 
I would be doing him a favor. Unfortunately, Wilson didn't always employ such taught. If he had, history might have been different. For example, Wilson didn't make the Senate and the Republican Party happy by entering the United States and the League of Nations. Wilson refused to take such prominent Republican leaders as Elihu Root or Charles Evans Hughes or Henry Cabot Lodge to the peace conference with him. Instead, he took a long unknown man from his own party. He snubbed the Republicans, refused to let them feel that the League was their idea as well as his, refused to let them have a finger in the pie, and, as a result of this crude handling of human relations, wrecked his own career, ruined his health, shortened his life caused America to stay out of the League, and altered the history of the world. Statesmen and diplomats aren't the only ones who use this make a person happy yo do things you want them to do approach. Dale O. Ferrier of Fort Wayne, Indiana, told how he encouraged one of his young children to willingly do the chore he was assigned, rather than have an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation about it. One day I said to him, Jeff, I'll make a deal with you. For every bushel basket full of pears you pick up, I'll pay you one dollar. But after you are finished, for every pair I find left in the yard, I'll take away a dollar. How does that sound? As you would expect, he not only picked up all of the pears, but I had to keep an eye on him to see that he didn't pull a few off the trees to fill up some of the baskets. I knew a man who had to refuse many invitations to speak, invitations extended by friends, invitations coming from people to whom he was obligated, and yet he did it so adroitly that the other person was at least contented with his refusal. How did he do it? Not by merely talking about the fact that he was too busy and too this and too that. No, after expressing his appreciation of the invitation and regretting his inability to accept it, he suggested a substitute speaker. In other words, he didn't give the other person any time to feel unhappy about the refusal, he immediately changed the other person's thoughts to some other speaker who could accept the invitation. Gunter Schmidt, who took our course in West Germany, told of an employee in the food store he managed who was negligent about putting the proper price tags on the shelves where the items were displayed. This caused confusion and customer complaints. Reminders, admonitions, confrontations with her about this did not do much good. Finally, Mr. Schmidt called her into his office and told her he was appointing her supervisor of price tag posting for the entire store and she would be responsible for keeping all of the shelves properly tagged. This new responsibility and title changed her attitude completely, and she fulfilled her duties satisfactorily from then on. Childish, perhaps, but that is what they said to Napoleon when he created the Legion of Honor, and distributed 15,000 crosses to his soldiers, and made 18 of his generals marshals of France, and called his troops the Grand Army. Napoleon was criticized for giving toys to war-hardened veterans, and Napoleon replied, men are ruled by toys. This technique of giving titles and authority worked for Napoleon, and it will work for you. For example, a friend of mine, Mrs. Ernest Gent of Scarsdale, New York, was troubled by boys running across and destroying her lawn. She tried criticism, she tried coaxing, neither worked. Then she tried giving the worst sinner and the gang a title and a feeling of authority. She made him her detective and put him in charge of keeping all trespassers off her lawn. That solved her problem. Her detective built a bonfire in the backyard, heated an iron red hot, and threatened to brand any boy who stepped on the lawn. The effective leader should keep the following guidelines in mind when it is necessary to change attitudes or behavior. 1. Be sincere. Do not promise anything that you cannot deliver. Forget about the benefits to yourself and concentrate on the benefits to the other person. 3. Be empathetic. Ask yourself what is it the other person really wants. 4. Consider the benefits that person will receive from doing what you suggest. 5. Match those benefits to the other person's wants. 6. When you make your request put it in a form that will convey to the other person the idea that he personally will benefit. We could give a curt order like this. John, we have customers coming in tomorrow, and I need the stockroom cleaned out. So sweep it out, put the stock in neat piles on the shelves, and polish the counter. Or we could express the same idea by showing John the benefits he will get from doing the task. John, we have a job that should be completed right away. If it is done now, 
We won't be faced with it later. I am bringing some customers in tomorrow to show our facilities. I would like to show them the stockroom, but it is in poor shape. If you could sweep it out, put the stock in neat piles on the shelves, and polish the counter, it would make us look efficient. And you will have done your part to provide a good company image. Will John be happy about doing what you suggest? Probably not very happy but happier than if you had not pointed out the benefits. Assuming you know that John has pride in the way his stockroom looks and is interested in contributing to the company image, he will be more likely to be cooperative. It also will have been pointed out to John that the job would have to be done eventually, and by doing it now, he won't be faced with it later. It is naive to believe you will always get a favorable reaction from other persons when you use these approaches but the experience of most people shows that you are more likely to change attitudes this way than by not using these principles and if you increase your successes by even a mere 10%, you have become 10% more effective as a leader than you were before and that is your benefit. People are more likely to do what you would like them to do when you use. Principle 9. Make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest. In a nutshell, be a leader. A leader's job often includes changing your people's attitudes and behavior. Some suggestions to accomplish this. Principle 1. Begin with praise and honest appreciation. Call attention to people's mistakes indirectly. Principle 3. Talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. Principle 4. Ask questions instead of giving direct orders. Principle 5. Let the other person save face. Principle 6. Praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. Principle 7. Give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. Principle 8. Use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. Principle 9. Make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest. A Shortcut to Distinction by Lowell Thomas. This biographical information about Dale Carnegie was written as an introduction to the original edition of How to Win Friends and Influence People. It is reprinted in this edition to give the readers additional background on Dale Carnegie. It was a cold January night in 1935, but the weather couldn't keep them away. 2,500 men and women thronged into the grand ballroom of the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York. Every available seat was filled by half past seven. At eight o'clock, the eager crowd was still pouring in. The spacious balcony was soon jammed. Presently, even standing space was at a premium, and hundreds of people, tired after navigating a day in business, stood up for an hour and a half that night to witness what? A fashion show. A six-day bicycle race or a personal appearance by Clark Gable. No, these people had been lured there by a newspaper ad. Two evenings previously, they had seen this full-page announcement and the New York Sun staring them in the face. Learn to speak effectively prepare for leadership. The people who responded were of the upper economic strata executives, employers and professionals. These men and women had come to hear the opening gun of an ultramodern, ultra-practical course in effective speaking and influencing men in business a course given by the Dale Carnegie Institute of Effective Speaking and Human Relations. Why were they there, these 2,500 businessmen and women? Because of a sudden hunger for more education because of the Depression? Apparently not, for this same course had been playing to packed houses in New York City every season for the preceding 24 years. During that time, more than 15,000 business and professional people had been trained by Dale Carnegie. Even large, skeptical, conservative organizations such as the Westinghouse Electric Company, the McGraw-Hill Publishing Company, the Brooklyn Union Gas Company, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, and the New York Telephone Company have had this training conducted in their own offices for the benefit of their members and executives. The fact that these people, 10 or 20 years after leaving grade school, high school or college come and take this training, is a glaring commentary on the shocking deficiencies of our educational system. What do adults really want to study? That is an important question, and in order to answer it, the University of Chicago, the American Association for Adult Education, 
and the United YMCA schools, made a survey over a two-year period. That survey revealed that the prime interest of adults is health. It also revealed that their second interest is in developing skill in human relationships they want to learn the technique of getting along with and influencing other people. They don't want to become public speakers, and they don't want to listen to a lot of high-sounding talk about psychology. They want suggestions they can use immediately in business, in social contacts and in the home. So that was what adults wanted to study, was it? All right said the people making the survey. Fine, if that is what they want, we'll give it to them. Looking around for a textbook, they discovered that no working manual had ever been written to help people solve their daily problems in human relationships. Here was a fine kettle of fish. For hundreds of years, learned volumes had been written on Greek and Latin and higher mathematics topics, about which the average adult doesn't give two hoots. But on the one subject on which he has a thirst for knowledge, a veritable passion for guidance and help nothing. This explained the presence of 2,500 eager adults crowding into the grand ballroom of the Hotel Pennsylvania in response to a newspaper advertisement. Here, apparently, at last was the thing for which they had long been seeking. Back in high school and college, they had pored over books, believing that knowledge alone was the open sesame to financial and professional rewards. But a few years in the rough and tumble of business and professional life had brought sharp disillusionment. They had seen some of the most important business successes won by men who possessed, in addition to their knowledge, the ability to talk well, to win people to their way of thinking, and to sell themselves and their ideas. They soon discovered that if one aspired to wear the captain's cap and navigate the ship of business personality and the ability to talk are more important than a knowledge of Latin verbs or a sheepskin from Harvard. The advertisement in the New York Sun promised that the meeting would be highly entertaining. It was. 18 people who had taken the course were marshaled in front of the loudspeaker and 15 of them were given precisely 75 seconds each to tell his or her story. Only 75 seconds of talk, then bang went the gavel, and the chairman shouted, time, next speaker. The affair moved with the speed of a herd of buffalo thundering across the plains. Spectators stood for an hour and a half to watch the performance. The speakers were a cross-section of life. Several sales representatives, a chain store executive, a baker, the president of a trade association, two bankers, an insurance agent, an accountant, a dentist, an architect, a druggist who had come from Indianapolis to New York to take the course, a lawyer who had come from Havana in order to prepare himself to give one important three-minute speech. The first speaker bore the Gaelic name Patrick J. O'Hare. Born in Ireland, he attended school for only four years, drifted to America, worked as a mechanic, then as a chauffeur. Now, however, he was 40. He had a growing family and needed more money. So he tried selling trucks, suffering from an inferiority complex that, as he put it, was eating his heart out. He had to walk up and down in front of an office half a dozen times before he could summon up enough courage to open the door. He was so discouraged as a salesman that he was thinking of going back to working with his hands in a machine shop when one day he received a letter inviting him to an organization meeting of the Dale Carnegie course in effective speaking. He didn't want to attend, he feared he would have to associate with a lot of college graduates, that he would be out of place. His despairing wife insisted that he go, saying, it may do you some good pat, God knows you need it. He went down to the place where the meeting was to be held, and stood on the sidewalk for five minutes, before he could generate enough self-confidence to enter the room. The first few times he tried to speak in front of the others. He was dizzy with fear, but as the weeks drifted by, he lost all fear of audiences and soon found that he loved to talk the bigger the crowd, the better. And he also lost his fear of individuals and of his superiors. He presented his ideas to them and soon he had been advanced into the sales department. He had become a valued and much-liked member of his company. This night, in the Hotel Pennsylvania, Patrick O'Hare stood in front of 2,500 people and told a gay, rollicking story of his achievements. Wave after wave of laughter swept over the audience. Few professional speakers could have equaled his performance. The next speaker, Godfrey Meyer, was a gray-headed banker, 
the father of eleven children, the first time he had attempted to speak in class, he was literally struck dumb, his mind refused to function, his story is a vivid illustration of how leadership gravitates to the person who can talk. He worked on Wall Street, and for 25 years, he had been living in Clifton, New Jersey. During that time, he had taken no active part in community affairs and knew perhaps 500 people. Shortly after he had enrolled in the Carnegie course, he received his tax bill and was infuriated by what he considered unjust charges. Ordinarily, he would have sat at home and fumed, or he would have taken it out in grousing to his neighbors, but instead, he put on his hat that night, walked into the town meeting, and blew off steam in public. As a result of that talk of indignation, the citizens of Clifton, New Jersey, urged him to run for the town council. So, for weeks he went from one meeting to another, denouncing waste and municipal extravagance. There were 96 candidates in the field. When the ballots were counted, lo, Godfrey Meyer's name led all the rest. Almost overnight, he had become a public figure among the 40,000 people in his community. As a result of his talks, he made 80 times more friends in six weeks than he had been able to previously in 25 years. And his salary as councilman meant that he got a return of 1,000% a year on his investment in the Carnegie course. The third speaker, the head of a large national association of food manufacturers, told how he had been unable to stand up and express his ideas at meetings of a board of directors. As a result of learning to think on his feet two astonishing things happened. He was soon made president of his association, and in that capacity, he was obliged to address meetings all over the United States. Excerpts from his talks were put on the Associated Press wires and printed in newspapers and trade magazines throughout the country. In two years, after learning to speak more effectively, he received more free publicity for his company and its products than he had been able to get previously, with a quarter of a million dollars spent in direct advertising. This speaker admitted that he had formerly hesitated to telephone some of the more important business executives in Manhattan and invite them to lunch with him. But as a result of the prestige he had acquired by his talks, these same people telephoned him and invited him to lunch and apologized to him for encroaching on his time. The ability to speak is a shortcut to distinction, it puts a person in the limelight, raises one head and shoulders above the crowd, and the person who can speak acceptably is usually given credit for an ability out of all proportion to what he or she really possesses. A movement for adult education has been sweeping over the nation, and the most spectacular force in that movement was Dale Carnegie a man who listened to and critiqued more talks by adults than has any other man in captivity. According to a cartoon by Believe It or Not Ripley, he had criticized 150,000 speeches. If that grand total doesn't impress you, remember that it meant one talk for almost every day that has passed since Columbus discovered America, or, to put it in other words, if all the people who had spoken before him had used only three minutes and had appeared before him in succession, it would have taken ten months, listening day and night to hear them all. Dale Carnegie's own career, filled with sharp contrasts, was a striking example of what a person can accomplish when obsessed with an original idea and a fire with enthusiasm. Born on a Missouri farm 10 miles from a railway, he never saw a streetcar until he was 12 years old, yet by the time he was 46, he was familiar with the far-flung corners of the earth, everywhere from Hong Kong to Hammerfist, and, at one time, he approached closer to the North Pole than Admiral Byrd's headquarters at Little America was to the South Pole. This Missouri lad who had once picked strawberries and cut cockleburs for five cents an hour, became the highly paid trainer of the executives of large corporations and the art of self-expression. This erstwhile cowboy who had once punched cattle and branded calves and ridden fences out in western South Dakota, later went to London to put on shows under the patronage of the royal family. This chap who was a total failure the first half dozen times he tried to speak in public, later became my personal manager. Much of my success has been due to training under Dale Carnegie. 
Young Carnegie had to struggle for an education, for hard luck was always battering away at the old farm in northwest Missouri with a flying tackle and a body slam. Year after year, the 102 River rose and drowned the corn and swept away the hay. Season after season, the fat hogs sickened and died from cholera, the bottom fell out of the market for cattle and mules, and the bank threatened to foreclose the mortgage. Sick with discouragement, the family sold out and bought another farm near the state teacher's college at Warrensburg, Missouri. Board and room could be had in town for a dollar a day, but young Carnegie couldn't afford it. So he stayed on the farm and commuted on horseback three miles to college each day. At home, he milked the cows, cut the wood, fed the hogs, and studied his Latin verbs by the light of a coal oil lamp until his eyes blurred and he began to nod even when he got to bed at midnight. He set the alarm for three o'clock. His father bred pedigree Duroc Jersey hogs and there was danger, during the bitter cold nights, that the young pigs would freeze to death, so they were put in a basket covered with a gunny sack and set behind the kitchen stove. True to their nature, the pigs demanded a hot meal at 3 a.m. So when the alarm went off, Dale Carnegie crawled out of the blankets, took the basket of pigs out to their mother, waited for them to nurse, and then brought them back to the warmth of the kitchen stove. There were 600 students in State Teachers College, and Dale Carnegie was one of the isolated half-dozen who couldn't afford to board in town. He was ashamed of the poverty that made it necessary for him to ride back to the farm and milk the cows every night. He was ashamed of his coat, which was too tight, and his trousers, which were too short. Rapidly developing an inferiority complex, he looked about for some shortcut to distinction. He soon saw that there were certain groups in college that enjoyed influence and prestige the football and baseball players and the chaps who won the debating and public speaking contests. Realizing that he had no flair for athletics, he decided to win one of the speaking contests. He spent months preparing his talks. He practiced as he sat in the saddle galloping to college and back. He practiced his speeches as he milked the cows, and then he mounted a bale of hay in the barn, and with great gusto and gestures, harangued the frightened pigeons about the issues of the day. But in spite of all his earnestness and preparation, he met with defeat after defeat. He was 18 at the time sensitive and proud. He became so discouraged, so depressed, that he even thought of suicide. And then suddenly he began to win, not one contest, but every speaking contest in college. Other students pleaded with him to train them, and they won also. After graduating from college, he started selling correspondence courses to the ranchers among the sand hills of western Nebraska and eastern Wyoming. In spite of all his boundless energy and enthusiasm, he couldn't make the grade. He became so discouraged that he went to his hotel room in Alliance, Nebraska, in the middle of the day threw himself across the bed and wept in despair. He longed to go back to college, he longed to retreat from the harsh battle of life, but he couldn't. So he resolved to go to Omaha and get another job. He didn't have the money for a railroad ticket. So he traveled on a freight train, feeding and watering two carloads of wild horses in return for his passage. After landing in South Omaha, he got a job selling bacon and soap and lard for Armour and Company. His territory was up among the Badlands and the cow and Indian country of western South Dakota. He covered his territory by freight train and stagecoach and horseback, and slept in pioneer hotels, where the only partition between the rooms was a sheet of muslin. He studied books on salesmanship, rode bucking bronchos, played poker with the Indians, and learned how to collect money. And when, for example, an inland storekeeper couldn't pay cash for the bacon and hams he had ordered, Dale Carnegie would take a dozen pairs of shoes off his shelf, sell the shoes to the railroad men, and forward the receipts to Armour and Company. He would often ride a freight train a hundred miles a day. When the train stopped to unload freight, he would dash uptown, see three or four merchants, get his orders, and when the whistle blew, he would dash down the street again lickety-split and swing onto the train while it was moving. Within two years, he had taken an unproductive territory that had stood in the 25th place and had boosted it to first place among all the 29 car routes leading out of South Omaha. Armour and company offered to promote him, saying, you have achieved what seemed impossible, but he refused the promotion and resigned, went to New York 
studied at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and toured the country, playing the role of Dr. Hartley and Polly of the circus. He would never be a Booth or a Barrymore, he had the good sense to recognize that. So back he went to sales work, selling automobiles and trucks for the Packard Motor Car Company. He knew nothing about machinery and cared nothing about it. Dreadfully unhappy, he had to scourge himself to his task each day. He longed to have time to study to write the books he had dreamed about writing back in college, so he resigned. He was going to spend his days writing stories and novels and support himself by teaching in a night school. Teaching what? As he looked back and evaluated his college work, he saw that his training in public speaking had done more to give him confidence, courage poise and the ability to meet and deal with people in business than had all the rest of his college courses put together, so he urged the YMCA schools in New York to give him a chance to conduct courses in public speaking for people in business. What? Make orators out of business people. Absurd. The YMCA people knew. They had tried such courses and they had always failed. When they refused to pay him a salary of $2 a night, he agreed to teach on a commission basis and take a percentage of the net profits if there were any profits to take. And in sight of three years they were paying him $30 a night on that basis instead of two. The course grew. Other is heard of it than other cities. Dale Carnegie soon became a glorified circuit writer covering New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore and later London and Paris. All the textbooks were too academic and impractical for the business people who flocked to his courses. Because of this he wrote his own book entitled Public Speaking and Influencing Men in Business. It became the official text of all the YMCAs, as well as of the American Bankers Association and the National Credit Men's Association. Dale Carnegie claimed that all people can talk when they get mad. He said that if you hit the most ignorant man in town on the jaw and knock him down, he would get on his feet and talk with an eloquence, heat and emphasis that would have rivaled that world-famous orator William Jennings Bryan at the height of his career. He claimed that almost any person can speak acceptably in public if he or she has self-confidence and an idea that is boiling and stewing within. The way to develop self-confidence, he said, is to do the thing you fear to do and get a record of successful experiences behind you. So he forced each class member to talk at every session of the course. The audience is sympathetic. They are all in the same boat and, by constant practice, they develop a courage, confidence and enthusiasm that carry over into their private speaking. Dale Carnegie would tell you that he made a living all these years, not by teaching public speaking that was incidental. His main job was to help people conquer their fears and develop courage. He started out at first to conduct merely a course in public speaking, but the students who came were businessmen and women. Many of them hadn't seen the inside of a classroom in 30 years. Most of them were paying their tuition on the installment plan. They wanted results and they wanted them quick results that they could use the next day in business interviews and in speaking before groups. So he was forced to be swift and practical. Consequently, he developed a system of training that is unique a striking combination of public speaking salesmanship, human relations and applied psychology. A slave to no hard and fast rules, he developed a course that is as real as the measles and twice as much fun. When the classes terminated, the graduates formed clubs of their own and continued to meet fortnightly for years afterward. One group of 19 in Philadelphia met twice a month during the winter season for 17 years. Class members frequently travel 50 or 100 miles to attend classes. One student used to commute each week from Chicago to New York. Professor William James of Harvard used to say that the average person develops only 10% of his latent mental ability. Dale Carnegie, by helping businessmen and women to develop their latent possibilities, created one of the most significant movements in adult education. Lowell Thomas, thank you for listening.